um, greetings to anyone who joins us around the world. And, and I'm Hugo, and I'm the academic officer of Ox Hong Kong School. Uh, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here today to chair today's workshop on academic writing and publishing. So um, for those who might not be very familiar with Hong Kong's Ox Hong Kong Scholars, uh, we are a student-run organization at Oxford University that aims to connect uh, people from Hong Kong and those who are interested in Hong Kong. So we regularly hold events um, to promote the research of our members and to showcase Hong Kong. Sorry, is, is that? Oops. Someone just told me there's some um, problem with the audio. Is, is, it, is it the case? Or is it... I think it's perfectly fine right now. You can go ahead. Yeah, great, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. So we regularly hold events to promote the research of our members and to showcase Hong Kong as a vibrant international city in Asia. So um, today we're very honored and delighted to have Professor Kevin Tai as our guest speakers to um, share his experience and insights on academic writing and publishing. So Professor Tai is an assistant professor of English language education at the University of Hong Kong and an honorary research fellow at IOE, the Faculty of Education in University College London. He is also an editorial board member for several prestigious journals, including the Language Learning Journal, the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism and Learning and Instructions. So with a PhD from UCL and an impressive chat record, as a junior researcher, Professor Tai has published over 20 high quality journal articles and book chapters since 2020, with a forthcoming book to be published in uh, 2023, which is a very you know, amazing record. Um, during the workshop, Professor Tai will share his practical tips and insights on academic writing and publishing for about an hour, and afterwards, we will have a QA section. Uh, but before we start, I'm happy to tell you that Ox Hong Kong Square will record the, we record the event and, and make it available on our official YouTube channel for everyone to revisit. So while we encourage you to share the link to the videos with others, uh, please be reminded that uh, unauthorized recording, editing, or uploading of the video to other platforms are prohibited. Um, but again, many thanks for your understanding and cooperation. So uh, we hope that you find this workshop informative and favorable. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome Professor Tai to the stage. Kevin, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, just allow me to quickly uh, share my screen. Um, one second. Sure, sure, take your time. Okay. Right. Can you see the screen? Is that clear? Yeah, okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for um, the society for inviting me today. Uh, thanks particularly to Hugo Tai, the academic officer, and also other committee members of Oxford University Hong Kong Scholars Association uh, for inviting me to deliver this workshop to graduate students at Oxford and also to participants from all our from other parts of the world. Um, I first got invited, I first I got involved in the association in 2017 when I was pursuing a master's degree in applied linguistics and second language acquisition at the University of Oxford. I actually delivered my first academic presentation at the 2018 research symposium organized by the association and I'm very grateful that I still remain the connection with this association. So in this particular talk, I'll be talking about academic writing and what it means to, uh, what are the good features of a research paper. So I will first talk about how to write a convincing abstract for journal or conference uh, submissions, what reviewers are looking for, and also I'll be talking about the peer review process in a nutshell. So why is it important for me to talk about abstract? You may think that it's just a, sh um, you know, a short paragraph of a paper, and normally it's around 150 words to 250 words, but it is a crucial part um, of your submission to international peer-reviewed journals. 
You will need to explain the main findings of the study briefly and clearly explain the relevance of your contribution to either theory or practice. So normally, in, uh, when you've submitted your paper to a journal, the chief editor will make an initial assessment of the potential and relevance of the manuscript. So this will be based on the journal objectives as stated in the aims and scope section with the primary question being, does this article contribute to either theoretical advancement or to potentially improving policy and practice? The second question is, will this article be of an interest to our international and diverse audience? The principal source for answering these two questions is the abstract that you provide. So in this respect, your abstract is the most crucial part of your submission. If you cannot clearly state the relevance of your contribution to either policy or practice in the abstract, it is likely to be death rejected in stage one. Therefore, it is important that you have argued your case convincingly in your abstracts. So here are some features that you would need to include in an abstract. So that includes uh, research gaps in the literature, the theor theoretical framework that you're using in your study, the aims of the study, the research methods that you're using, uh, briefly mentioning about the research context, the main findings of the study. And finally, that will be the most important bit, will be the main argument of your study. What is the argument that you want people to cite uh, in your paper? So maybe I will give you an example. So this is an abstract that comes from one of my uh, paper, papers that was recently published in Applied Linguistics, which is the most prestigious journal in the field of linguistics. So perhaps I will give you one minute to just to have a look at this abstract, then we'll, I will go through the features. Okay, so perhaps we can go through the abstract together. So it's a very short one. And um, so if you look at the first sentence, when I, uh, when I say, despite the extensive research on translanguaging in bi or multilingual classrooms, research on the context of first language classrooms remains scarce. So here I'm pointing out the research gap in the field, um, particularly in the uh, research area of multilingualism and um, translanguaging uh, research. Lots of research has been looking at uh, translanguaging practices in multilingual classrooms. We need to empower our uh, multilingual learners to mobilize diverse resources. But there is a lack of research looking at translanguaging practices in first language classrooms. So here is the gap. And then I move on and explain how this study can address the gap. So here I, I am arguing that this study fills the research gap by examining how a translanguaging space was created in a first language classroom to prepare students to inhabit a world with different linguistic and cultural practices. I then move on to briefly explaining the data source and the background of the study. So in this case, the data were based on a linguistic ethnographic project in a first grade, first language, English language arts classroom in the United States. Then I move on to explain the research method that I used for analyzing the data. So I used multimodal conversation analysis and interpretive phenomenological analysis to conduct uh, the data analysis. Then, you, then I moved on to highlight the key findings uh, in this study. So um, we, we argue that the construction of a translanguaging space in English as a first language classroom has a transformative effect on students' learning since it transforms the ways in which students view languages as resources for communication, appreciate cultural and linguistic diversity in our contemporary society. 
And finally, I point out the argument that I want people to pay attention to. Particularly, I want to emphasize that translanguaging spaces can be designed for all students and to empower native English speaking students. So the findings substantiate the argument of translanguaging as an inclusive pedagogical resource for promoting social justice and equity in the classroom. In other words, it is not only bilinguals who need to enhance their communicative repertoire, rather all students, including native first language speakers, have to develop their capacity in making use of the best available resources and knowledge for achieving specific communicative goals in social interactions. Therefore, it is important for teachers to acquire knowledge of translanguaging in order to develop of students' uh, well-being and their identities as citizens in this multilingual and multicultural world. So now you can see that towards the end of the abstract, it is important to have a very strong sentence that clearly uh, represents the argument of your study. There are, um, there are lots of journals in uh, linguistics, but personally, I'm in charge of two journals. Uh, so the first one is the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism, where I serve as the assistant editor. Well, the second one is the Language Learning Journal, where I'm the associate editor. Um, for these two journals, uh, as you can see, when it when it is listed as a social science citation indexed uh, journal, it means that it has impact factor. For the second one, the language learning journal, it is considered as an emerging source citation index listed journal. So that, that means it is still waiting to be uh, to be upgraded to SSCI and to be assigned an, an impact factor. So I understand. So you may know that academics nowadays are very keen to go for uh, journals that are listed in SSCI because it counts towards their promotion and it's important for junior professors such, such as myself to go for journals that are listed in SSCI. But um, there are lots of, but there are some things that. Uh, people may not know is that um, different journals um, have different uh, policy and um, the the reason for being rejected by one journal can be can can have, can be quite different from the other so perhaps I will just use these two journals as an example as I go along I'm also uh, editing a special issue, which is called the role of multilingualism in content and language integrated learning classroom context. And that is uh, for the journal called Learning and Instruction. That is actually ranked 10th uh, in the category of education and educational research. And it has a very high impact factor. As you can see, it's 6.636. So when I'm editing this special issue, we have to be very uh, selective in um, selecting the best abstracts for including in our special issue because it has a very, it enjoys a very high impact factor. And when we look at the abstracts for doing the shortlisting, what we are looking for is really the argument. So are you providing a strong argument that can contribute to theoretical um, discussion and also does it really pro uh, promote methodological rigor? So perhaps I will briefly talk about the review process from submission to uh, selecting reviewers. So I will be, as I said, I will be using the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism and the Language Learning Journal as examples. So first of all, the chief editor will conduct the first screening. So it's either will be desk rejected or will be, uh, or, uh, or the editor will decide to send it out for review. Then the associate editor or our assistant editor will conduct second round of screening. So in this case, I will be reading those papers again to, to decide whether it is actually okay to send it off um, for peer review. 
The reason is because for journals like the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism has a very high impact factor in the field of linguistics. So for IJBEB, we actually receive submissions almost every day. In, so because the editor who that would be Professor Li Wei and myself, we are university professors as our full time job. We don't really get paid for doing this kind of editorial work. So in order to uh, make sure that we are sending sending out the best papers to peer reviewers, we have to be very selective. And nowadays, it's actually quite difficult to look for reviewers. If you think about it, if we have submissions almost every day, we can't really ask uh, reviewers uh, to conduct all these um, uh, voluntary reviews for the journal because reviewers, they don't get paid. And for evaluating a paper, normally we would choose two or three reviewers in relevant fields. So it can be it can be PhD students, it can be postdoctoral fellows or university professors. The reason why PhD students will be invited to conduct our peer reviews, uh, con uh, evaluating manuscripts is because we don't we really struggle to identify reviewers. Um, for the case of the language learning journal, for example, because it is still in a stage of um, waiting to be listed in SSCI, um, university professors may are not really keen to contribute uh, in evaluating papers for us. So um, editorial boards, including my uh, board members, including myself, um, need to think strategically, uh, who can actually have the time and the expertise to evaluate the papers. So for the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism, so it's IGBEB, it's because we receive so many submissions, uh, usually if we receive a one minor revision and one major revision, or if it's one minor re revision or one rejection, we still allow authors to make um, um, revi uh, to make changes or revise their manuscript. But if we have uh, decisions that involve two major revisions, then it will be rejected by the chief editor simply because we have too many submissions and we cannot um, we simply cannot manage the workload. For language learning journal, because it is still waiting to be listed in SSCI, it is a ESCI listed journal, uh, which is uh, more lenient. We, uh, the chief editor usually allows authors to revise when receiving two major revisions. So in once you receive major revisions, then of course it will be if you make normally it will be accepted at the end and it will be sent out to copy editing and production. So for those journals or you know for IGBB or language learning journal, my main responsibility is really to select reviewers for evaluating manuscript, which is a very important role because uh, if because I'm responsible to find the most suitable uh, person um, or reviewers, uh, more than one really, to look at the quality of your paper and decide whether it can be um, further, for, whether it can be sent, whether it can be proceeded to another stage, which will be major revision or minor revision. So here are some characteristics of desk reject papers. So um, normally, what I, I actually receive papers that is that are really out of the scope is not really related to bilingual education. In the case of a special issue that I'm editing, some people send me papers related to phonological, phonological awareness of second language speakers, but my special issue is about content and language integrated learning. So you need to make sure that uh, your paper fits with the scope of the journal. Also, a narrow focus without a convincing rationale will be a reason, serious issue with analyzing the data, um, issues with academic writing. So this is not an issue that I have seen um, 
so far as I think a lot of submissions that I have read have very good academic writing. But I think the main reason why papers are being death rejected is simply, uh, mostly because of uh, providing weak arguments, failing to demonstrate new insights, or failing to provide substantial new information to the field. So here are also some characteristics of rejected papers after review. So if when I decide to send this paper for review, it doesn't mean that your paper will, will definitely be accepted. Reviewers still have their own stance. So what are the issues that, you know, force re reviewers to say no to your paper? Normally, it will involve uh, issues like framing and rationale of the study and not being clear about the aim of the study. Uh, literature review, so the scope, relevance, organization, uh, the effectiveness in identifying research gaps or failing to demonstrate a compelling argument. So it's important that you uh, clearly identify what are the research gaps that you aim to fill. And you need to achieve that through doing a thorough literature review. In terms of uh, methodology, uh, I have seen papers who fail to provide uh, detailed information about data collection and also data analysis. We need to make we need to see that you are provide your use of methodology is robust and is rigorous. In terms of findings, you need to make sure that it's organized. Uh, if it if, I've seen research studies that tries to do interview, really only relying on interview data and doing very basic thematic analysis. You need to make sure that even though you're doing thematic analysis, you are following um, uh, following of some kind of protocol and procedures to make sure that your analysis is rigorous. In terms of the interpretation of findings, it's important that you um, you have a theoretical framework that you are drawing on and relate it back to that framework. So we need to you need to make sure that the interpretations uh, are actually grounded in findings and is related to theory. Misalignment between literature review findings and discussions. So that means when you are mentioning something in literature review, but for some reason, those things are not being reflected are not really connected to the findings and discussions. So you need to make sure uh, everything aligns and everything is coherent. And finally, a uh, lack of significant contribution. Again, it's important that you need to make sure that you're providing new insights to the field, not just about confirming findings in previous research. We want to see that your finding is contributing something new to our field. So what are the characteristics of accepted papers? So normally it would be a good topic, relevant and meaningful to the field, a sound literature review, so up-to-date and focused, leading to convincing argument or theoretical motivation of the study. It normally, you know, normally it has a robust methodology, so appropriate research design, sufficient details of the methodology, research context, and procedures for analyzing the data. In terms of findings, uh, normally these papers are clearly presented, really addressing the research questions. And uh, in terms of the discussion section, it draws on the theoretical framework or literature and the, and the arguments are really grounded in the findings. So you cannot make claims that are not being reflected in your uh, data analysis. And finally, is the implication. So, you know, in what ways your findings will lead to uh, any in useful implications to the field. So you can think about your contribution from four different aspects that will be theoretical contribution, methodological contribution, uh, empirical contribution, and uh, pedagogical implications or policy implications. Finally, it's important to acknowledge the limitations of your study and also promote our future research ideas. So, you know, how, how future research can build on your existing work. So it may sound quite vague when I say, you know, here are some characteristics and um, some people may think that it's very, it's, 
it's easy to say that you need to have robust me uh, research methodology, you need to have very clear literature review, you need to have very um, rigorous data analysis section. Perhaps what I would do now is to share what the research exercise framework in the UK or the research assessment exercise in Hong Kong are doing. So for REF, the REF and also uh, RAE in Hong Kong, they will invite reviewers uh, from different universities to evaluate the professors of research publication. And they will look at the papers from three different criteria, originality, rigor, and significance. So perhaps I will talk about that uh, step by step. So it will provide you some information, uh, like some insights in terms of what a good paper will look like. So firstly, for originality, it is understood as the extent to which the output introduces a new way of thinking about a subject or is distinctive or transformative compared with previous work in an academic field. So research output that demonstrate originality may do one or more of the following. So producing new empirical findings, engaging with new or complex problems, developing innovative research methodologies, providing new arguments, collecting and engage with novel types of data and or advanced theory or analysis of policy or practice or doctrine, so or new forms of expression. So this is what it means by originality. In terms of significance, it is understood as the extent to which the work has exerted or is likely to exert an influence on an academic field or practical applications. So if it refers to the extent to which the work has influenced or has the capacity to influence knowledge and scholarly thought or the development and understanding of policy and or practice. In terms of rigor, it is understood as the extent to which the purpose of the work um, is clearly articulated. An appropriate uh, methodology for the research area has been adopted and compelling evidence presented to show that the purpose has been achieved. So rigor is uh, understood at, as an extent to which it, you are promote, it, the work demonstrates an intellectual coherence and integrity and adopts robust and appropriate concepts, uh, analysis, theories and um, methodologies. So I mentioned about the four aspects of contributions that your study can make. So uh, I will just quickly recap that. So the first one will be theoretical contribution. So you need to think about how your study can provide a good theoretical argument, how it contributes to theory building, and how your study can shape the conceptualization of a particular theory. Like the second aspect will be methodological contribution. So how your study can develop innovative research methods, methodologies, and analytical techniques. The third aspect will be empirical contribution. So if your study tries to fill in the gap by addressing the lack of data sources in a particular research topic, and finally, practical contribution. So is your study, can your study really provide any impact to our society? Can it contribute to policy making or practice? In education, for example, we talk about pedagogical implications. So how your study can provide implications to teaching, teaching and learning. So this is the four aspects that are uh, that is quite useful for you to think about your research study, particularly if you're developing your PhD research proposal, that's actually a good way of thinking about the impact of your study. So perhaps I will give you examples from two published papers two of my published papers to explain how my study leads to originality, rigor, and significance. So this is a study that was published in Language and Education in 2019, and it was actually based on my uh, master's degree thesis at Oxford University. And um, 
This study argues that second language development is a gradual process of controlling the right gestural and linguistic resources for appropriate communicative purposes. Why this argument is important is because a second language development in the field of second language acquisition has typically been studied through employing traditional quantitative methods, including pre and post tests, to solely assess the students' out outcomes of performance. But in my study, I adopted sociocultural theory as the theoretical framework, and I use conversation analysis as the methodological approach to examine how second language development is a gradual process which requires students to get acquainted with the target language items and employ the relevant verbal and multilingual and multimodal resources contingently in a range of different but relevant situations to demonstrate their conceptual understandings of the meanings of the target language items. So the analysis has shown that conversation analysis allows researchers to observe some evidence of second language development. In terms of rigor, the study conducted a four-month uh, microanalysis to document qualitative changes in second language learners' understanding of the meaning of specific vocabulary items, which were previously explained by the teacher. So the study addresses the gap that little attention has been paid to explore how learning processes emerge in and through the minute details of naturally occurring occurring interactions. Therefore, the results of such fine-grained analysis potentially provide a comprehensive picture of the process of learning and development in the moment-to-moment -moment unfolding of classroom interaction. In terms of the significance of the study, um, the methodologically, this study has helped advance the field by demonstrating how using conversation analysis to trace second language development over time can help paint a richer picture of students' learning processes. So the study has shown that second language students pay attention to the teacher's use of gestural resources, and they can appropriate uh, these gestures to display their understanding of second Second language knowledge. So a possible suggestion, therefore, is to enhance teachers' awareness of the possible effects of the use of gestural resources to facilitate students' second language learning and development. Pedagogically, teachers can pay attention to the student's use of interactional resources in the lessons because it can provide valuable diagnostic information for the teacher and facilitate the evaluation of the student's current knowledge state. So now I will provide another paper that was published in 2021, and that was with my uh, professor, uh, with my PhD supervisor, Professor Li Wei. So that was published in Applied Linguistics. It's part of my PhD uh, findings. So in terms of originality, I was arguing that translanguaging appears to be a critical resource and that there are different social factors, including the teacher's personal beliefs, uh, personal history, sociocultural and pedagogical knowledge, all these factors can play a role in constructing playful talk. And these are the important factors that enable researchers and teacher educators to understand how the teacher creates a translanguaging space to achieve a range of pedagogical goals in playful talk. In terms of the significance of the study, the study has pedagogical and policy implications for implementing monolingual English medium instruction policy at the classroom level. This prompts the policymakers to recognize translanguaging as an empowering tool for promoting linguistic diversity in the classrooms and maximizing language uses for linguistic and semiotic resources in knowledge construction. In terms of the rigor, so my study was an intensive linguistic ethnographic study and it was carried out in an English medium instruction secondary school in Hong Kong. Uh, 
Also, this is the first study that uniquely integrates multimodal conversation analysis with interpretive phenomenological analysis in order to understand the complexities of teachers' translanguaging practices. I have shown how combining these two methodological approaches can allow researchers to study how translanguaging practices are constructed in multilingual classrooms and how teachers make sense of their translanguaging practices at particular moments of classroom interaction. So uh, part of my PhD is really to promote both theoretical contribution and also methodological contribution. And this is a book that is uh, that uh, Hugo briefly mentioned at the beginning. It's, uh, it's a book that will be published in April. It explains how multimodal conversation analysis and interpretive phen phenomenological analysis are useful research methodologies for understanding how and why translanguaging practices are constructed by participants in the classroom. And I argue that such a combination of two uh, methodological approaches offers a refreshing and practical way of examining the intricacies of translanguaging practices in diverse classroom contexts and also in diverse social interactional contexts. So throughout my um, doctoral journey, uh, lots of people have been saying to me that I was very successful in publishing a lot of my, a lot of papers from my uh, projects. Um, and uh, actually, I finished my PhD within three years, and I was able to publish around five papers, and I combined them together in into my thesis. I was able to achieve all these before my PhD viva. As a result, I often um, get asked questions such as, how do you publish peer-reviewed journal articles during your MPhil or PhD? Um, what, how, you know, do you have any tips on publishing for other uh, postgraduate students? What kind of challenges have you faced in publishing as a PhD student? And what strategies can I provide to students so that they can improve their chances for, of getting published? So I don't really have a lot of tips, um, but he, based on my own experience in publishing empirical research and acting as um, associate editor and assistant editor of leading journals in applied linguistics, uh, I would like to share three tips for publishing during your uh, PhD. So firstly, it's important that you need to have a strong argument for your paper. So as I have mentioned, if you look at the abstracts of published papers, the argument is really just the one or two sentences that form the basis of your whole paper. So you need to think about why is it important for the reader to read your paper? What can the reader learn from your paper? How do the findings of your research provide implications for policy making or um, educational practice? Secondly, uh, you can consider co-authoring research papers with your PhD supervisors. Ideally, your supervisor will be willing to support you and reframe your arguments so that you are good enough to be published in high impact journals. Finally, look for the right uh, journal for your paper. So the first thing that you need to do is to look at your reference list and see what journals you have cited. That will be a very good indication of what journals will be relevant to your research topic and therefore more likely to accept your paper. Uh, journal editors will be interested to see whether your paper has referenced papers that are published in their journals. And that is certainly that is exactly what IJBEB is doing. The first thing that we'll do, we will do is to look at whether you have cited any papers that are published in IJBEB, because if you don't do that, it's very likely we will, it gives us an impression that you are not really engaging uh, with the recent research that are published in our journal. Another tips that I would like to provide, it's the final tip is really to use your favorite research articles as model. That will give you a sense of reassurance so you can look at what other people are doing and use and adopt their style accordingly. 
And so the main challenge that I have encountered in publishing during my PhD is really uh, dealing with the peer reviewers' uh, ruthless comments. Um, I'm I'm being very honest here. Um, Although I published lots of papers, I still got rejected by journals. And just like not long ago, actually just yesterday, my paper was rejected by a journal. So it's actually quite common. It's really, you think that I'm I'm very uh, like a, you think I'm a leading scholar, I'm able to publish papers without any worries. That's actually not true. Every one of us go through the same process. I also uh, got rejected for many times, but you just need to keep going and um, be positive. And I understand that being rejected by journals can be really discouraging. And sometimes you may uh, question yourself, uh, why do I have to go through such a process? So I have come to feel that the more comments that I read, the more it prepares me to deal with these comments calmly and uh, professionally. Regarding responding to the harsh or negative reviewer comments, I think we should deal with them as we would deal with uh, with any other comments. Uh, give a point by point response to the comments, mentioning whether you agree or disagree with them. If you really disagree with the reviewer's comments, you can provide reasons for doing so. If your paper is rejected and you feel that like, and the, you don't think the reviewer's comments are reasonable, that's okay. Just move on and go for another journal. It's similar to just think of, just use the metaphor of dating. If that person doesn't like you, just go, just go and find another person. Someone out there will appreciate you. So finally, it is important for PhD candidates to um, actually build a supportive network of other people that they can bounce ideas off and get feedback from. You can talk to your uh, supervisor. Um, obviously, your supervisors know you, uh, they know your project, they also know um, uh, your relevant research or any teaching opportunities. But it's important that you build up a strong network with your peers as well. You can talk to your uh, PhD or MPhil students, they will know exactly what you're going through and they will be able to provide different insights into the PhD. In fact, a couple of my best friends, uh, they are actually my PhD uh, peers, you know, it's because we, we stick together, we help each other out and we listen to each other's concerns. So that's really pretty much it from me. As early career academics, uh, we are really operating within an increasingly challenging environment. And there are expectations for us to develop our teaching repertoire and our research publication records during our doctoral studies. I need to reinforce the point that when you go out to seek for Professorship is not just about research publication. Teaching experience also matters. So you need to try your best to obtain teaching experience at your university, uh, work as a postgraduate teaching assistant. It can be really frustrating at times, but it is also a privilege to be able to create new knowledge and immerse yourselves in the theoretical questions that interest you. So I will uh, encourage everyone to enjoy the doctoral journey and make the most out of it while you can. Um, so um, again, thank you, Kevin, for taking the time and effort to share your expertise with us today. Your experience and insights are obviously very helpful to, to our participants and, and to me. And we greatly appreciate your dedication to promote the knowledge exchange because Kevin is actually the one who, who requests to uh, make the videos of the recording today online. So, um, and for all the participants, we hope that you find the workshop today to be helpful and informative and that you are leaving with some insights, which I believe you will. And to improve your academic writing and to increase your chances of publishing your work, um, so to stay up to date with our, our upcoming events or activities, we encourage you to subscribe to our uh, social media channels to follow us for updates, including our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So um, we look forward to seeing you again and at our, our future events. So again, thank you, Kevin. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.